Bills Mafia, what is going on? It is Thursday. You know what that means. Today, we're going to be talking with Matt Harmon of Reception, per- Reception Perception to talk about Curtis Samuel and what he thinks might help the Buffalo Bills this coming season. And of course, we got to do our weekly mock draft. We will hit all that and more. Let's get it. Bills Mafia, what is going on? Welcome. Happy uh, happy Thursday to you guys. I Man, I'm, I'm a little bit scatterbrained today. We, uh, we're trying to get everything set back up. Anybody who doesn't know, my wife and I officially announced yesterday we are expecting our second child. And so we, uh, we decided to take my camera that I stream with, my my Sony and try to do some photos with my son and my settings were all jacked up. So let's just say I, things are a little bit off, off the rails right now, which is pretty typical for this, but uh, I'm excited. Tonight's gonna be an awesome show. We have a fantastic guest tonight. Somebody I uh, am very excited to talk about. I'm sure a lot of you guys are excited to hear from, uh, but we're going to be talking with Matt Harmon of reception perception about everything that happened with the Buffalo bills talking about Curtis Samuel and what he believes. Cause he is the Curtis Samuel backer of all backers uh so we're going to talk about that we're going to be talking about what's going on with the buffalo bills in free agency maybe if there's any other moves obviously we saw some stuff happen this week we'll talk about the nfl draft come up in just a couple short weeks and then we'll get to our mock draft live tonight with all of you so here we are again my name is thomas Loss. you can find me on twitter at the thomas to loss uh, i'm glad that you are here tonight or if you're tuning in uh and it's friday Happy Friday to you. Again, once again, thank you for uh, you know choosing to listen to us. You can find us free on all social media and streaming platforms, including Spotify and YouTube, or however you choose to pod. Also want to make sure you are hitting that subscribe button right now on our YouTube page, as well as the notification button. It'll let you know every single time we are live. Super Chats are open for this and every Cover One show, so if you want to be heard, you know how to do it. I want to hear from you. Guys, again, we are in the thick of the offseason, so make sure you are signed up for the Cover 1 One Pass. It provides you all the best analysis, all the best coverage heading into the 2024 season, and you know we are getting into the thick of it. There's a lot to talk about, a lot to cover, and quite frankly, a ton of stuff that the Bills are in the thick of. So, But before we get too much further, let's get right into it. Let's talk to our guest tonight, a guy that... uh, a lot of you have heard of, if you listen to WGR 550 out of Buffalo, you know he pops on every once in a while because Jeremy White is obsessed. Uh, but this is the guy that is behind the Reception Perception website. Reception Perception is a fantastic uh, just info, I, I, like a swath of everything you could possibly want to know about wide receivers. So, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Harmon. Hey, Thomas, appreciate you for having me, man. Uh, yeah, this is not the first time uh, where a Buffalo Bills wide receiver, Buffalo Bills transaction has happened, uh, and, and I've been called on to talk about this player because, you know, before I was, well, I mean, I've, I've been a big Curtis Samuel guy for a long time. Before that, I was a big Stephon Diggs guy as well. Uh, so, yeah, this is a this is a team that I, I've, I've paid a lot of attention to over the years because of these wide receiver transactions. But you, more importantly, man, Congratulations to you and the family on the announcement of, uh, of another child. That is incredible. Great news. And uh, happy, happy congratulations to you and the family. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. We we are actually not going to be finding out. My wife has somehow twisted my arm that we are going to wait till the baby is born to find out. So, Ooh. yeah. And I'm not very Ooh, good with surprises. <laughs> I know. I'm not very good with surprises, but here we are. So we're going to go through with that and see how that works. Needless to say, I appreciate it. We are very, very excited and uh Great days ahead, but let's get right into it. Obviously, as you mentioned, Curtis Samuel, a guy that, you know, I think a lot of Bills fans earmarked, you know, uh, played under Joe Brady in Carolina, a guy that kind of fits that, you know, what they call rack run after catch profile that 
you know, Brandon Bean, Joe Brady, Sean McDermott have really talked about quite a bit this offseason. So I guess when you're looking at Curtis Samuel and, uh, you know, being a huge fan of his and the way he performs and everything he brings to the table, what do you see uh, right on the, the forefront or on the onset that you think is going to make Curtis Samuel successful in Buffalo with Josh? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that stood out to me when this signing happened, and um, I'm glad you guys were, were on this because, you know, when I was doing kind of like free agency matchmaking, I didn't even really consider the the Buffalo Bills as an option just because I had kind of pegged them as a team that was going to look right. in the draft. And they still might look in the draft, and obviously we'll talk about that later. But just in my vision, I thought they, they were kind of looking for – you know, because I figured Gabe Davis was moving on. I, I, I figured they'd get priced out of the Gabe Davis business. And, you know, G- Gabe has got his strengths as a player, uh, sure. but he's like a pure kind of straight line vertical receiver. Um, sometimes like this isn't even necessarily like a shot at who Gabe is as a player. It's just sometimes certain type of receivers contribute to the overall issues that we find with an offense. And I think in Buffalo, sometimes it felt very – sporadic and consistent you know and even if the overall numbers are really good offensively sometimes it definitely felt like there were big peaks and valleys and that's going to happen when your number two receiver is Gabe Davis like that just with the type of player he is but I so I thought they'd kind of be looking for more of a souped up version of a play like a better version of what Gabe Davis is that's not what Curtis Samuel is at all however one thing that stands out to me just in terms of dropping him into this offense I will obviously talk about some of the gadget stuff with Curtis Samuel but this is where I've always been with him is that he's a separator man like he is a guy that gets open you can line him up in the slot you can line him up as a flanker you can line him up outside and he's a guy that gets open um you know I think in Washington they net didn't really maximize that enough but it was also uh, a hit or miss offense a lot of quarterback issues you know they also had other really good wide receivers on that roster I'm a big Terry McLaurin fan as well I like Jahan Dotson as a guy who can continue to develop so and honestly I was not a big fan of the Eric the enemy offense last year as well so (laughs) I don't think they got the most out of Samuel in Washington but Joe Brady so far is the guy that's gotten the most out of Curtis Samuel not just as a slot receiver but as a pure wide out too so for me the biggest impact that I think he's going to have for Buffalo is he's going to give them actual separation in the intermediate area which other than Stefan Diggs they have not employed a player who can consistently do that the last few years now based on that with that profile that you're calling you know obviously we know that Gabe Davis you know more of a strider big body high points ball you know really that atypical x receiver that guy that you know I think Josh still needs now that you've got a guy like Curtis Samuel do you think that's a tell per se because you know you've got Khalil Shakir you know you've got Stefan Diggs you know, Curtis Samuel kind of falls in between those two. He's mm-hmm. kind of that intermediary with the both of them. Do you think that tells to maybe what the offense, what they're trying to do? Or is it just they saw Curtis Samuel as a, we want to add this type of just element to our offense, regardless of if him, he's not that Gabe Davis type, you know, he's not, he's not going to fall in that same line and we're not going to line him out on the boundary because for most of his career, I think 80% of his career, he's lined up in the slot. So to assume that he's going to do a lot of boundary work is probably foolish to say the least. So does this tell you anything that they're bringing him in? I think it definitely tells you that they know to get the most out of Josh Allen. They need guys that are going to separate, that are going to give him windows to hit. And really, honestly, if you want to talk like another, by the way, another reception perception favorite, John Brown was the first signal to me that they really understood that assignment. It's actually, I mean, again, we're talking – Panthers we're talking Bills there's a lot of connective tissue here it used to really frustrate me you know watching the Panthers and seeing what they did with Cam Newton was oh this is a a quarterback whose accuracy can kind of come and go let's give him big targets to hit let's give him guys that have these wide catch radiuses in theory uh, and and were these bigger hulking wide receivers well then you end up with a receiver core of Kelvin Benjamin and Devin Funchess and guys that Mm -hmm. can't separate which if you have a quarterback who has I I wouldn't even say Cam Newton was an inaccurate quarterback, but I think he had like kind of inconsistent accuracy, if that makes sense. Like there were for sure come and touch and go moments with the accuracy. I don't think Josh Allen is that quarterback so much anymore, but he definitely was that guy while he was developing early in his career. And I think what the Buffalo Bills have done is so much better because like let's 
increase the strike zone because this guy's open instead of like, all right, well, you know, because at the same time, like a 5'11 guy and a 6'5 guy, if he's got, if he, both those players have somebody in their hip pocket, it's still a harder window to hit. So for players like Curtis Samuel, who, who can give you that separation, obviously that's what Diggs' calling card is. That's what John Brown's calling card was with separation and, of course, the vertical game. I think it just shows you that they understand to get the best out of Josh Allen. I think incentivizing him to take these layup throws, which Samuel's going to give you, incentivizing him to take open throws in the intermediate area of the field, that's really going to get the best out of him as a player. Yeah, it's definitely been something that, I mean, you could see from his just his onset of becoming the quarterback of the Bills. It's try to rein in Josh to yeah. not try to get that home run ball all the time. And I think you're right, to a degree, bringing in guys that, whether it's forcing his hand or provide him more of an appealing look that maybe he'll go ahead and actually, you know, try to do what the offensive coordinator wants because you've seen it time and again, Josh will do what Josh wants to do. Balls in his hands. Can't really stop him. Um, so what I want to do real quick is obviously you've got your graph that you created, which, you know, for a lot of people, it, it very much looks like, uh, Chinese, right? So if you would be so kind, explain what this is, explain what this means and what people can see out of this that can tell them what is Curtis Samuel. Yeah. So this is the route percentage chart. There's two main route charts in reception perception. This is the route percentage chart, which is just showing you in the sample for reception perception, which is an eight game sample for every NFL player. This is how often they ran each individual route type. So a green, it's a route that they ran above the NFL average. Yellow, it's within the NFL average. Red, it's below the NFL average. So for this particular graphic, when we're looking with Curtis Samuel right here, you see he's a 7.7% on nine routes. He's not. He was not used as a vertical receiver very often with the Washington uh, Commanders last year. Uh, obviously, much more short to the line of scrimmage. 22% slants, 18.5% curls, 5.5% screens. You know, that's where the big chunk of his route tree was. The other chart is the route success rate chart which shows you how often they get open on each individual route type and that's kind of where we're talking about samuels again this guy is going to be you know short routes maybe intermediate routes but nine route success rate 60 percent on nine routes last year 80 percent on corner routes last year like let's not get it twisted this is still a guy who can fly like he can burn you down the field so using the two charts in conjunction uh, is the best way I think to do this, a uh, best way to interpret the data because it can kind of show you, yeah, where the usage is, but also where the efficiency is. And then uh, the other main, the main metric for reception perception is again, success rate versus coverage. But I break it into man zone press and Curtis Samuel has always been a top tier man coverage beater. Even last year, uh, 80, 82nd percentile success rate versus man coverage, 75.4%. I've charted four seasons for Samuel. He has never been below 75%. If you just go through the historical mm -hmm. database, there's some really impressive company that he's around. So, yeah, he's, obviously he's not an elite tier receiver, but he does have some real clear strengths in terms of beating man coverage. And I, I do think there is something to be said for the fact that if you look at the laundry list of quarterbacks that he's played for and the fact that almost every year of his career in the NFL, he's had a different OC, it definitely lends itself to, I think the ceiling's a lot higher than people are seeing. Oh, yeah. And I think people are personally believing, and especially Brandon Bean has an eye for, ta or a, just a knack and an eye for talent and finding them, i.e. Jordan Boyer, Micah Hyde. I mean, you, the list goes on. I think there's a lot more in untapped potential like you've seen here and what it shows. I guess my question is, where do you think he falls in terms of this offense? Because... You know, I think a big point right now, obviously, you know this. I, I you know, like I said, you talked to Jeremy White, and Jeremy White's been banging the wide receiver train. When it comes to that, uh, and there's I, <laughs> every time I say wide receiver train on the show, that's what he does to me now. Uh, in <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, in terms of, you know, obviously, we know that they're going to be looking for a, a wide receiver in the draft. What do you think this means for the Buffalo Bills with Curtis Samuel? Where does this place them uh, in terms of what they're going to be looking at? Because what what does Curtis Samuel, what is he for the Buffalo Bills? Is he, could he fall in line as their number two receiver? Do you see him as more of a four? I, I guess, what do you think is the best course of action to deploy him and make it the best and most successful for Joe Brady in the offense. So I think the great part about this move with, with Curtis Samuel, and honestly, I think that the Chiefs did something similar with Marquise Brown, that 
by acquiring these guys at cheaper market rates than you know some of the other players that are available in free agency typically get those big money deals. Obviously, certainly less than what the Tennessee Titans gave Calvin Ridley, um, right. or even what even what the Jags gave Gabe Davis, or I mean, Darno, damn, Darnell Mooney got from the Falcons. Like, and I, I, I mean, I, Darnell Mooney's a fine player, but I like Curtis Samuel and Marquise Brown a lot more. But this this gives you this gives you flexibility right that it, it, before these two transactions were made before Curtis Samuel was added to the bills I would have said like if the bills don't come away with a receiver in round one they're going to be in a lot of trouble that that's going to be a big problem because I think they needed prior to Samuel like a day one starter in their 11 personnel package beyond Stefan Diggs and Khalil Shakir I do really like Khalil Shakir I, I really liked him as a prospect thought he was a I thought he was probably more of like a late day two guy that ended up going the fifth round. And I don't think he's necessarily just a slot only player. Just like, I don't necessarily think that Curtis Samuel is a slot only player. I think you can get those guys reps at flanker. I think that, you know, if you, you want to, you want to throw Curtis Samuel out at X occasionally, I think he can do that. It's probably not where you ideally want to use it, but if you want to get digs out of that X receiver position, you can do that. I think, Right now, without another rookie added, I think your main package in 11 personnel is going to be Diggs as the pure boundary receiver, most likely playing X. And, and, and again, you know, Gabe Davis was mostly that guy, but Steph Diggs can play at that X receiver position because he can beat press man coverage at a really high rate. He's probably your X, and then you're going to have Shakir and, and Samuel rotating between that flot and slanker position. You're probably going to want to have – if it's Samuel um, as the flanker, maybe you have Diggs on the line of scrimmage and, and Samuel's kind of running those dagger routes where Diggs is carrying defenses deep and Samuel in cuts or vice versa. You can definitely do that as well. So I think that's good enough to be an 11 personnel package. That being said, if they find the right receiver in the first round, second round, third round, they should absolutely still take that player because you don't, in my opinion, you don't want to be back in a position where you know, no disrespect, but you're throwing like passes to Trent Sherfield in a playoff game. Like you, mm. you're, you're th you know, Deontay Hardy's back on the field or like, oh, Isaiah McKenzie, he's a kick returner. Like, let's <laughs> let's see if he can work as a receiver. Like, you don't want to be back in that position if you're Buffalo. So and, and like, by the way, all of these guys are kind of I'm not saying they're samey, but there's there's a little bit of overlap here. Like, For sure. why? Why? Why would we not want more of like a pure X? You know, if we and then we have more flexibility with what we can do with Diggs. So there's definitely still room to add a player here. But I think if you have to go into the season with Diggs as your one, you know, and Samuel and and Shakir as kind of your two three, any given week these guys can swap back and forth because you also have a high volume tight end. Hopefully in Dalton Kincaid, I think you can get away with that. Now you kind of just led me right into this, which is great. Um, you know, with the Buffalo Bills, obviously, you know, and like we said, with Gabe Davis on the outs, there's a very big void. I mean, 100 targets right there that you are really trying to, I mean, a guy that had an A dot of like 17, you know, a ton of touchdowns for the Bills was really, I mean, big, big play Gabe was his moniker. Yeah. So that with that being said, when you're looking at the Bills at 28, and we know that, I mean, unless, unless Brandon Bean moves heaven and earth, to get a guy like Roma Dunze, Malik Neighbors, or Marvin Harrison Jr., which I would be very stunned, but I with Brandon Bean never say never because the guy is just wheeling and dealing all the time. Who do you think fits the Bills that's in a realm of possibility of reality, either at 28 or close to uh, in the first round or so, that fits the necessity, fits the void that Gabe Davis has left? And then beyond that, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. But if there's other guys that you think maybe beyond that point, maybe the third, the fourth, the fifth round that are ancillary options, but maybe still provide a, a, a pretty high ceiling. So before the Samuel move, uh, I just kept thinking again along the lines of we're looking to replace Gabe Davis, but we're looking to get a better version of that player. To me, that is Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU. Because mm. um, I'm with you. I don't think that they're going to get up to one of these top three prospects in Marvin Harris and Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze. But, man, those guys would be, like, exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about <laughs> in terms of a, a true X. Because to me, I like – now that, again, now that you have Samuel, but even before this, what the player that I want if I'm Buffalo in the first round is I want somebody that can be a day one impact player. Now you don't necessarily have to have them be a day one impact player, but still sure. it, would, it would be nice. 
day one impact player that can eventually develop and be into being a number one wide receiver whenever the Stefan Diggs era does come to, to an end here. And I mean, at some point it will come to an end because receivers Absolutely. change and, and, and that just is what it is. So I, I think Brian Thomas is probably not ready right hitting the ground running to be a number one wide receiver in the NFL where I think that like, I really have a lot of confidence, especially Marvin Harrison and Roman Dunze. Like you can have them be your number one X receiver tomorrow and you can, you're ready to rock. Like they're, they're those type of prospects neighbors, separate discussion, but probably, probably still feel that way, but he's just a little bit different in terms of where you want to line him up and deploy him. But Brian Thomas, I think is a tear down from those guys, but I think he does have the tools and the skills to be kind of like a faster T Higgins, which I mean, sounds pretty exciting if he does hit that ceiling, but that's sure. along the same archetype of what we're talking about here is that type of receiver. I tend to think he's not going to get to 28. I think he probably would require a trade up, um, which they have done before. I, be like, I believe they traded up for Kincaid. They've traded up for, mm -hmm. for players before when they have a specific target that they want. So don't rule it out to me. If I'm Buffalo and I'm sitting at 28, I'm really hoping that uh, AD Mitchell out of Texas falls to that range because man, he, he's a guy that I definitely see the tools. I definitely see the developmental path for him to be a guy that can be your starting X receiver. Um, eventually, maybe even you're know, throwing him out there in packages right away, starting at the beginning of the season. Cause I think he can separate. He shows the ability to run routes at that size um, where, you know, there's maybe like a Michael Gallup path there. Eventually if he develops, like we're thinking maybe somewhere along the lines, like an Allen Robinson type when he was in his prime with Jag, with the Jaguars. Mm -hmm. And then even uh, with the bears later on in his career, like those are kind of the type of players when I see if he's able to hit that ceiling, um, I know other people have better, com like higher comparisons, but I'm a big fan of his game, and that's kind of the type of player I'd be hoping if I'm going 28. That's where I'd think about with him. Now, there are a couple guys that are borderline. You don't really know what they are. Guys like Xavier Worthy, um, you know, Xavier Legat, a guy that's a converted quarterback into wide receiver. How, if you're the Bills, right, and you're sitting there it, with the way you diagnose wide receivers, how do you decide if it's worth spending at 28 on a guy that's a fringe, maybe back end first round pick? Because obviously, you know, you got that fifth round op or fifth year option, which is invaluable to a lot of guys, i.e. T Higgins right now. We're seeing that, um, you know, and especially with, with the defensive needs for the Buffalo Bills, we know defensive tackle or safety, you know, there's some big needs on defensive end for the Bills. How do they go ahead and say? what's too much you know we've seen land but lad mcconkey has been probably one of the biggest risers of all wide receivers thus far people think he could go middle of first round all the way to the end of first round who knows um how do you diagnose like how do you make a decision as to how much is too much yeah i, I would say that with where the wide receiver market is right now i'm not even going to really think about that fifth year option because, I mean, look at San Francisco right now where they've got Brandon Ayuga. And it's like, oh, we've got him under contract for one more year on his fifth-year option. He is not happy about that, playing on that fifth-year option if that comes to pass. And that's why you're seeing – look, if I'm if if I'm the 49ers, there's no way you're prying Brandon Ayuk out of my hands. But that's why you see these trade rumors right now with Jacksonville, with – um, you know, I, I think the Pittsburgh Steelers have been kind of mentioned. The Jets have been mentioned as maybe interested. Like, And I don't want that, right? And then I don't certainly don't want him to go – my like all pro level receiver to go in and be pissed off in week one. Cause we're like, yeah, he's on his fifth year option, which at this point is so below market rate for, for top 10 level wide receivers. And, and if you're drafting a guy in the first round, yeah, you're mm -hmm. hoping that he kind of gets into that ballpark. Right. So, or, or eventually is kind of considered in that group. So for me, I'm not necessarily thinking like, Oh, if I get this guy in the end of the first round, like I'll just take him cause I get that fifth year option. Um, there's a lot of depth in this class for sure. I, I do wonder just because of how specific I think that need for like a big upside outside receiver is for Buffalo. I wonder if they, they get pretty honed in on a player in the first round. Cause um, there are guys that are going to be second round picks. Like you mentioned lad McConkey. I mean, shoot, let me tell you what they could take lad McConkey and then they're just, you can go four wide at that point. You can, and shoot, you can even go empty at that point because you have Dalton Kincaid 
And, like, we've got a lot of slot mismatches at that point. Because I, I, I think Ladd McConkey is sort of in this same bucket of uh, Curtis Samuel where I think he can play in the slot. But you've seen him run routes and get separation as an outside receiver. Like, run sure. big boy outbreaking routes. So, uh, maybe you look at him in that way. Because um, I, I, I do think, like, quality just really matters. Um, it's nice when you can kind of build your team, like, build your receiver room like a basketball team. I know Daniel Jeremiah says that all the time. I do kind of subscribe to that idea, but at the same time, like, man, if you're Buffalo, you, you find somebody that's kind of off that typological path, I would totally understand that. I do think, though, my kind of general feel about this class is once you get to the back half of the second round, I do think we're talking about more developmental players, and we're talking about guys that are ready to rock right now. Now, that that, that maybe that take ages terribly, um, but if I'm Buffalo, I do kind of start to think, like, all right, if I'm waiting for – uh, a Leggett or you know maybe one of those two LSU wide receiver not LSU uh, Washington wide receivers the other two guys beyond Roma Dunze Polk uh, and McMillan Polk and yeah. Millen, yeah like maybe those guys are contributors but I don't think they have that upside of like when Steph Diggs leaves these guys can be our wide receiver ones right um so I guess and we'll kind of wrap it up to this is there a name or two middle rounds third through fifth that if the Bills decide you know maybe the maybe the draft doesn't fall the way they want it to and we know that could happen there could be a run of six seven wide receivers and the bills get left and they're like okay well you know uh, jazir newton is here and falling in my lap we're taking him is there a wide receiver or two that you think in the later rounds or mid rounds that maybe it might take a little bit longer but would fulfill the necessity that gabe davis left yeah, I think Javon Baker does stand out as a guy that's a perimeter receiver, uh, most likely. Uh, I also think Jamari Thrash is a nice little separator, a little bit mm. underrated there, too. So those are two names that I think might be more so, like, not second-round guys. Um, although, you know, they could get up into the second round. With receiver, you really just never know because it's so tight-based. It's so team-based. Um, those are two guys I think I'd consider if we're looking for more pure boundary players. Uh, I think they both can play outside, and that is really – it stands out. Because, again, I do think that's really if – I'm, if I'm Buffalo, I'm kind of honing in on that as the big need here. Um, as much as I, I – like, I really like these guys. You know, Roman Wilson is interesting, but he's more of like a speed element that kind of overlaps with some of these players, and he's probably a guy that's going to go in the second round at this point. Um, you know, you – you didn't ask about Keon Coleman, but Keon Coleman's like a big receiver that's going to be more of that early second round. I, to me, I think he's a second rounder. I don't think he's a first round talent, but he's I don't not either. a guy. Yeah, but he's not a guy that I want lining up at X. Like I actually kind of th this is seems disrespectful because of the player that Chase Claypool ended up being, but he gives me like rookie year Chase Claypool vibes where you can design ways to get him. Yeah, I know it's like nobody gets excited when you say Chase Claypool, but like <laughs> design ways to get him the ball, get him routes on the move, stuff like that. That could be successful for him. I don't think that's what Buffalo needs. So if I'm not able to get one of these like X receiver prospects in the first or second round, I think Baker and I think uh, maybe Thrash, not as much, but J Baker really stands out to me as somebody that could be interesting. Okay. I got one more question for you. The Buffalo Bills over the past year obviously have seen Stefan Diggs from the start of the season to the end of the season were two different people, dramatically, in fact. I need you, I need your opinion to to maybe help Bills fans compartmentalize what's going on. What do you think is going on with Stefan Diggs? Are we on the tail end of his career, or do you think it could be injury related? I mean, what have you seen about Stefan Diggs? Is there a tell to you? Yeah, you know, and Stefan and I have talked a lot over the years. Um, we kind of have come up a little bit together, you know, at times. And we've talked about reception perception and route running and stuff like that. So, you know, we have a good relationship. And um, I actually asked him that him that this year straight up, like during Super Bowl week, what was the deal, you know, back half of the season. Um, to him, I think he envisioned it more as this is a – and this is something that I think we don't talk about enough with this offense in particular – Typically, when you see an offensive coordinator fired in the middle of the season and somebody else promoted, they're just going to run the same playbook. They're going to run a lot of the same concepts. They might do certain little tweaks here and there. But I don't know. You can tell me if you disagree with this. They, I think they really overhauled things in Buffalo, and they threw a lot of different stuff out towards the end of the year. So to him, that was kind of his view in terms of why the production wasn't there. Because when I watch him play, I still think this is a guy that looks like he can separate. But – they were running him on some different routes towards the end of the year. It was almost more short or deep. Like there wasn't a lot of this intermediate stuff, which man, right. you know, that's going to be tough when again, your wide receiver two is Gabe Davis. Cause he's not doing a lot of that intermediate stuff. So that's why it then feels like your passing game is so boomer bust. So 
you know, I couldn't get anything out of him in terms of whether there was injuries there or not. But to me, I wondered, like, if there was an unreported injury. I know there was the weird moment where they, like, cut off a press conference when they asked about um, injury and stuff like that. So I I'd always kind of wondered if maybe there was an injury situation there, and that's why his role felt a little weird because – I don't see anything different with him on film in terms of like maybe you could vi- can convince me he's a step slower, which that happens with wide receivers. But in terms of his ability to run routes and separate and consistently get himself open, you know, that was definitely there. And for sure. And he took accountability with this. There were drops on his end. And, you know, Josh Allen has said this, too. There were moments where he you know missed him on deep routes that could have changed the narrative about this whole thing. So I think a lot of it is just sort of stuff happens w- with, sure. with wide receiver quarterback connections. Uh, but in terms of Diggs, the player, I don't see a big drop off, which honestly makes the conversation a little more tough to tough to get a good answer on. Um, but sure. yeah, a lot, of, a lot of different things I think at play there. Beautiful. Well, Matt, hey, I uh, I genuinely appreciate you uh, spending a little time tonight with us. Uh, let everybody know where they can find your content and uh, you know what where they can subscribe to everything that you deliver. Yeah, you can find me on social media at Matt Harmon underscore BYB. Uh, also, receptionperception.com is the website. Uh, three tiers of subscription. Uh, if you want all of the Curtis Samuel data for your that he's ever been charted, you can sign up for the sicko package because you are a sicko if you want that. And we love you for being a sicko at Reception Perception. Also, on YouTube, uh, be easy for you while you're here, uh, you can go subscribe to my channel. I have a Curtis Samuel video coming out in probably the next week. Uh, breaking okay. down some of his historical data, really diving into the charts and, and alignment and stuff like that, which I think will be pretty pretty cool for Bills fans to see. Beautiful. Matt, hey, I definitely appreciate it. And uh, maybe after the uh, draft, we can have you come in and diagnose what the Buffalo Bills did in the first round if it's a wide receiver. Would love to do it. Yeah, just let me know. Appreciate it. Beautiful. Matt, take care. And uh, guys, make sure you give Matt a follow. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks, man. See you. Guys, that was Matt Harmon from Reception Perception. Uh, awesome, awesome content right there. And, uh, I mean, what can you say? He broke that down beautifully. A lot of stuff to really talk about and diagnose. In terms of Curtis Samuel, obviously we know that I, I, when the Bills brought Curtis Samuel in, and you know, if you watch this show, I talked about Curtis Samuel. I was emphatic about the idea of the Bills signing him all the way back since December and January. I thought it was a great move. He fit he fit a void, I think. And to be honest with you, he's 5'11", 195. He's a thicker uh, wide receiver for being 5'11". Uh, you know, he definitely closer to that 200 range, which is perfect. But he does a lot of things that I think the Bills desperately have been just kind of lacking, like Matt was saying. His ability to create space and separation and yards after the catch are going to be huge. Um, I think he is going to be beautiful for the Buffalo Bills in terms of just being able to create on the fly. And I I think for Josh, like we were talking about, having a guy like Curtis Samuel with the Buffalo Bills is going to be invaluable for Josh because I think one thing that we've we've lacked, and again, something I've talked about, not having that pressure release valve for Josh has been a sorely missed attribute to this Bills offense. When Cole Beasley was on this team, you felt like Josh was almost invincible because you knew at the very minimum he could get the ball out fast and you'd be fine, right? You knew you had Cole Beasley. You knew you could get Cole to the sticks. So I think not having him was something that you just you had to replace, and we haven't quite found it. I think Khalil Shakir is on his ascension, which is great, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, Shakir in just a second. But before I do so, before I do anything else, you know, Matt Harmo was talking about his uh, his subscription. Well, our subscription, the Cover One One Pass, is something that you can get in on the Slack chat. Which, if you're not on the Slack chat, or if you are in the Slack chat, you know we break all sorts of uh, type of details and information on there. Greg Thompson drops little nuggets of uh, really cool stuff, and all of us are kind of in and out of the Slack chat, talking with everybody who follows Cover One. But uh, you want to hear more about it? Greg and Aaron from Cover One Buffalo will tell you more. Many people ask us the best way to support us here at Cover One, and that is to sign up to become a Cover One One Pass member. That contribution helps give us the access to all the data and information we use to create the content that you love. 
and I think most importantly brings you into our community of insiders. It's a great community based on Slack. I know a lot of people don't wanna be on social media anymore or be in on those conversations. We bring all of it to you right in our great community of educated fans. And most importantly, you get access to our content creators. Even better than that, everybody loves merch. You get awesome t-shirts, a cool decal, and a letter from the Cover One team signed directly to you. All for $60. That gets you the entire season, next year's free agency and draft. 60 bucks. Click the link in the description. Cover One Insider. Become one today. There you have it right there. That is Greg and Aaron, which, by the way, guys, I'm just going to say hello tonight. Uh, RJ, Roy, Mike, uh, Mally, um, Adam Luloff, Popeye, Hugo, Bills fan, 7883, I in the moment. Um, who else? We had? Charles G. Welcome, guys. Uh, Vibin on Pluto, you know, and John Robert. Guys, what's popping? How are we doing? Um, you know, really, really, really appreciate you tuning in tonight. Make sure you get that thumbs up and make sure you guys tune in. Uh, you know, after this at nine o'clock, Greg and Aaron will be following me again this week. What a surprise! What an uh, what a what a exciting part to this week. You get me, and then you get two of the best to follow me up. Um, but let's talk about what, what we're kind of continuing on. Obviously, you know Khalil Shakir kind of with his ascension. If you you know, if you follow me on Twitter, you know I was just talking about Shakir. I think um, – oh, good. I'm glad. Daniel, what's going on? Um, you obviously know that I, I think Shakir is – on the precipice of of truly greatness. I think he is going to be one of the best young wide receivers. He's going to get paid for the Bills. He's going to. If you watched what he did, he had an 82.6 catch percentage or 86.2 something of that nature, Ian can tell me. Uh he was one of the uh one of the most prolific wide receivers, number 1 in catch percentage in 2023. Really really good stuff. And I think when you utilize him and, you know, Curtis Samuel, two guys that one have four three four four speed uh 86.7 catch percentage by the way when you have that type of speed and th that type of route running they're going to create havoc they're going to cause all sorts of mismatches on that offense then you got stefan diggs who's one of the best route runners in the nfl you got dalton kincaid who in his second year in this offense is going to continue to become a better wide receiver tight end whatever but you get the picture he is going to become more and more prolific a guy that his hands are some of the best you have four guys right there whose hands are some of the best in the nfl i think that is going to provide huge boosts to this team i think dawson knox is going to make uh you know his name known again i think he had a rough last couple of years you know two years ago there's brother passing away last year in and out of injury i think him being added to this offense and then again we don't know what's going to happen in the draft. And, folks, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the draft a little right here, right? In terms of the NFL draft, and we know we're in on the wide receiver train, but if we're talking about the draft, I think the one thing about this is we finding that wide receiver X is going to be pivotal, right? Because you know you've got a bunch of smaller guys, and I'm all for all for having speed and incredible route running, great hands, a lot of just – Absolute mismatches, right? Not quite Edelman's, but a bunch of guys that are a little bit smaller, you know, that 5'11 to 6'1 size, not that prototypical 6'3, 6'4, 6'5 X receiver. But you have these guys with really good speed, really good hands, really good route running. Those are going to be great. But I do think there is something to be said for adding somebody that might be a little bit taller, right? A guy that can high point the ball and, you know, a guy that can be Josh's vertical or you know, that nine route can be that guy and also in the red zone. Obviously, we know we like Brian Thomas. I, I have talked in length, in length about Brian Thomas and what he can bring to the Buffalo Bills. I mean, his 40 time at the NFL draft or at the NFL combine was amazing. I think it was a 4 3 4. Uh, I'm going to bring that up right now. I apologize. 4 3 3, excuse me, 95th percentile. Um, a guy that's just booming i mean his stock is rising like crazy and the one question mark about him is obviously you knew he was with malik neighbors and yes he had a really really good year but was it part in because he was with malik neighbors and if you check back a couple shows ago i did have caroline fenton from lockdown lsu 
she told us all about uh, Brian Thomas. And yeah, there is a, he's more of a project than Malik Neighbors, but I don't think he is. I don't think he's a question mark in terms of talent. I think it's the right situation is going to bode well for him. And to be honest with you, I think Buffalo is just that. I think Buffalo is a good position and a good spot for Brian Thomas to land because the necessity for him to step right in is not there. It truly isn't. I don't think the Buffalo Bills need Brian Thomas Jr. to step in and be the guy. He can learn under Stefan Diggs. He can learn with Khalil Shakir and Dalton Kincaid and Curtis Samuel. He can learn on the fly and be able to grow as a wide receiver, get better at his route running, get more nuanced with his release packages, right? Those are important pieces to his game. Now, Brian Thomas Jr. is a bigger guy, 6'3", 209, so he's got good height, good good size, good weight. So he's not going to get bull, or bull rushed off the line in terms of press man corners. But you do want to have him become more of a well-rounded wide receiver. You don't want a guy, and I, again, no disrespect to Gabe, Gabe Davis. I love Gabe Davis, but you could tell Gabe Davis was limited in how he was playing his game, right? We knew that. Um, Josh Allen is definitely not horrible at the deep ball. Josh Allen's very good at the deep ball. He got off of the deep ball, and I think inherently, I think that has to do with the fact that two years in a row, he's had issues with his shoulder. He had a rotator cuff injury, and then he had uh, like an elbow. I mean, we saw it when he got his um, his AC joint kind of twisted up. So I think those things are going to be an issue for Josh once he gets back to being able to train in the offseason, have his wide receivers at, at his disposal. I think he's going to be a lot better. But I think that was obviously a question mark. And I, I'm not going to say that he didn't he didn't struggle because he absolutely did. That is 100% uh in ucl of sorts um but josh has been a very good deep ball thrower if you look some of his best throws of all time were deep ball throws and in fact if we're going to use that and i'm going to call you on it i'm going to call you on it just like if i say something off the cuff call me on it josh allen had one of the most beautiful postseason throws of all time to stefan diggs that stefan diggs dropped he had a 60 plus yarder on a rope that landed almost in josh's uh, stefan's arms Come on. I mean, let's be fair. Let's be honest. Let's be let's be at least, uh, you know, at least somewhat subjective to this. Josh Allen has one of the better deep balls. Is he Kurt, Kirk Cousins? No. Kirk Cousins is probably the greatest deep ball thrower or one of, of all time. Like, you know, Aaron Rodgers, one of the greatest deep ball throwers of all time. But let's be fair. He, he also is a very, very good deep ball thrower aside from that. You want to get guys that can provide that. Obviously, we know Brian Thomas Jr., you know, Matt mentioned Adonai Mitchell, a guy that seems to be the bell of the ball in terms of guys that, you know, they people think the bit will end up with the Bills is that Adonai Mitchell. Troy Franklin, a guy that I had spoke at length with, I've kind of softened on him a little bit just because he didn't have a great combine, but still good size, good speed. Um, wasn't as fast as I anticipated, wasn't as tall as I thought, but we'll see. We'll see what he looks like in the next, you know, if the Bills believe in him, you know, coming out of Oregon, you know, obviously he's got all the tools. Lad McConkey, a guy that we have talked about in length, in length, and just a guy that provides pretty much everything you can ask for. He's got good size. He's got great speed, incredible hands, imp- I mean, impeccable route running, really good feet. I, I think that's that's another guy that's interesting. So there's a bunch of different options right there. But before we get any bit further about the you know about the draft and how that how that's going to shake out, I do want to talk about what's happened this week because I think it parallels to the draft. Obviously, we saw the Bills sign Mike Edwards this week, a safety who played for the Kansas City Chiefs, a guy that is two uh, two time Super Bowl winner winner excuse me, coming from the Bucks, then going to the Chiefs. In a guy that, to be honest with you, Chiefs fans are sad that he's gone. And it'll tell you, if Chiefs fans are sad, you know it's a big deal because Chiefs fans are very, very honest to the to a fault. So I am very excited about the addition of Mike Edwards. I don't think that necessarily um, dispels the idea of them going for a safety in the draft. I think they very much will. I'm, I'm intrigued to see if they go for another 
uh, you know, veteran safety in the free agent market. There's still a bunch of names, and I've got this right here. I always make sure I got the free agent tracker up so I can tell you guys and talk about you know what's available, what's out there. So in terms of free agent safeties that are still out there, you've still obviously Mike Edwards was just signed, but you still got Jamal Adams, Justin Simmons. Eddie Jackson, Quandre Diggs. We don't know what the deal with Micah Hyde is. There has been no definitive answer besides a couple months ago, his wife posting something that was kind of cryptic, but we haven't gotten a, a surefire answer there. Uh, Tashawn Gibson, who's been in the league for a long time, in fact, so much so, if you don't remember, Tashawn Gibson was the guy that knocked uh, EJ Manuel out of a game a while back. So there's Ashton Davis, uh, Julian Blackman, a guy that was brought in. It'd be intriguing to see if he ends up signing. There was some some uh, speculation that they might be talking contracts. So we'll find out more there. But I, the reason I bring that up is because what does Mike Edwards tell you, right? What does Mike Edwards make it so that the Bills don't go ahead and get a safety early? And I, I didn't think that they would. I mean, you've got guys, and man, would I love to have Tyler Newbin. I think Tyler Newbin would be an outstanding addition to this team. Outstanding. Um, he has he usurped Antoine Winfield Jr. as probably the best safety coming out of Minnesota in their history. Uh, was prolific for Min, the Minnesota Gophers. I, I would love to have him. I don't know if I want to take him in the first round, but... He is definitely could be an invaluable piece to that secondary, a secondary that's young, right? That's getting younger, you know, with the the departures of Poyer, with the departures of Trey White. They are obviously trying to just retool that entire group and bringing in a guy like Tyler Newbin would, would absolutely speak to that. But I think Mike Edwards, does that tell you that maybe they're not going to attack safety early? Or maybe they think that they can go and go a defensive line in the first round. Obviously, you saw Daquan Jones was a guy the Buffalo Bills went ahead and they brought back. I think that was pivotal. I think it was an important piece. Um, but obviously, they've done some other things. The Buffalo Bills, <coughs> excuse me, um, they brought in Nicholas Morrow, Mac Ollins. Um, they did sign Casey Tuhill, uh, a little bit of an athletic defensive end out of uh, Washington. Not. Not super prolific, but very toolsy, very athletic. It'll be intriguing to see how they deploy him. Probably says, you know, kind of spells the end of Shaq Lawson, which I love Shaq Lawson, one of the best edge setters that we've had in a long time in terms of run defense. Uh, so it'll be intriguing to see what they do. Um, but having Cam Lewis, Taylor Rapp, and uh, obviously Mike Edwards, it'll be intriguing and really, I keep saying intriguing too much. It'll be uh, definitely something to keep an eye on as to the safety position. And I think in terms of defensive line, there are still big question marks. We still need a bunch of snaps fulfilled for that defensive line, defensive end position. Leonard Floyd's gone. Shaq Lawson's gone. So what do they do there? I think that's going to be a, a big time question. What? How are they going to attack the first round of the NFL draft? And I know a lot of us are on the wide receiver train in terms of you know, trying to kind of address a glaring need because as much as people think that it's not, Gabe Davis leaving is a glaring need. That's a whether you like Gabe or you hate Gabe is irrelevant to the fact Gabe leaving was 90 plus targets and at times a very potent offensive weapon. You have to get somebody to fill in for that. You have to, you know, and I love Curtis Samuel, but Curtis Samuel's not that guy. Could he be? We'll see. It'll be intriguing, and I keep saying intriguing. Dear Lord, I got to get that word out of my uh, out of my uh, my wheelhouse. <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, so it, it'll definitely definitely uh, be something that you know. Will, will Joe Brady utilize Curtis Samuel as an X receiver on the boundary? Will he use him to kind of stress the secondary with that speed with just the ability to, you know, be very, very elusive. That would be a question mark. So I just wonder how that's going to call, you know, into, you know, the draft, what they're going to look at, how they're going to address some massive needs. And so what we're going to do, guys, we're going to get into it. But before, actually, before I do that, scratch that, before I get into this, 
I have to go ahead and do my ad read because otherwise I'm going to completely forget. One of our fantastic sponsors here at Cover One is Underdog Fantasy. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and bring this up because I think, oh, no, my brother's there. I wondered if he fell asleep. (laughs) Cover One is excited once again, partner with the most dynamic name in fantasy football. That is Underdog Fantasy. I want to tell you about the easiest way to get some action on the NFL. It's Underdog Fantasy in their Pick'em game. Just pick higher or lower on your favorite or least favorite player's stats, and you can win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Underdog keeps it super simple with their easy-to-use website and mobile apps. Pick between two and five players to fill out your Pick'em entry. Get every right. Take home some cold, hard cash. Use the code COVER1 and get your first deposit doubled up to $200. Underdog Fantasy, the best and easiest play to fa- play fantasy sports. So there we are, right there. Um, but yeah, guys, in terms of wide receiver, it's really going to be something that I, I, I'm not ex- sure. I'm not entirely sure what they're looking at, right? Because you've got the big guys, you've got the big receivers. You know, we mentioned Keon Coleman, we mentioned. Uh, you know, Brian Thomas Jr., Adonai Mitchell's a bit of a bigger guy. You've got some, you know, a litany of big, big wide receivers. Um, do they attack the big receiver or do they say, you know, uh, to hell with it? And do they just try to get guys that are fast and elusive and great hands, impeccable route running? And I mean, guys that are like Stefan Diggs, because Stefan Diggs was and is number one, you know, wide receiver one. He's only six foot, just six foot one. He's not a big dude. So I don't think you necessarily have to have that big guy to fill that role. You know, I I wonder what that looks like to the Buffalo Bills. What does that look like to Brandon Bean? What how do how do they diagnose the issue and do they feel that they're going to go a different direction? That's that's a big question mark. So in terms of the NFL draft, let's get right into it. You know we do this every single week. You know we do the mock drafts and we take a look. When, by the way, uh, happy March Madness to everybody. Uh, I, I got Duquesne right today. I was very pleased with myself. I hadn't watched a single college basketball game this year. I apologize. I know it makes me look foolish, but... Um, <laughs> I didn't watch any, so the fact that I got that right, uh, that was cool. By the way, cheers to all of you. And uh, if again, if you didn't hear my announcement earlier today, my wife and I are expecting our second child uh, come October 2nd, so that's very, very exciting. Cheers to that. Cheers to uh, having two children now. So very, very, um, very pumped up. And uh, Ian, why don't you go ahead, actually, if you could find that that photo I posted on Facebook, I can throw that up there so they can see the announcement that I had with uh, my son and the the Doppler of uh, my little baby. But let's get right into the mock draft right now, guys. We're going to do this like we did last week, uh, but what we're going to do is we're actually going to go a little bit slower, okay? And we're going to see how everything kind of shakes out, and maybe, just maybe, is there a chance... Uh, (laughs) maybe is there a chance that, you know, Brian Thomas falls close to us? Let's see. So what we'll do is, you know, we will potentially offer up trades. We're going to go five rounds. We'll offer up trades and see what we have available to us. So let's go ahead and, uh, let's take a look and see how everything kind of falls. Right now we got Malik neighbors at six, Talese Fuaga, Byron, Byron Murphy, Brock Bowers to the bears, Fashanu to the jets, Jaden Daniels to the Vikings. A lot of a lot of very good talent still on the board here. Okay, we are at 20. Okay. So 20 so far. We still have Brian Thomas Jr. Okay. And what I'm gonna do, I want to bring up the uh Rich Hill uh draft value chart just so that I can get accurate numbers because I don't want to lead you astray. But from 28. All right from 28 to uh 20 it is 60 points okay 60 points so if the bills wanted to move from 28 to 20 they would need to clear 60 points right so the bills don't have a third rounder uh they do have a second rounder okay so obviously you wouldn't be able to utilize any type of second or third rounder in there, which is unfortunate. So if you wanted to move up, you could do a second rounder 
and then they would give you some points back. So if that was the case and you moved up to 20, which is Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh has 119, which is middle of the fourth. You would give them your second rounder and you'd get a fourth rounder back. I don't love that. I don't love having to wait from the first on pick 20 all the way to having the fourth rounder. Granted, we'd have four fourths. I don't I don't really love the idea of that. So let's go ahead. I think, you know, I don't know if you guys feel this way. I'm thinking maybe go down a little bit. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Pittsburgh already went. So we're on the Dolphins. Excuse me. Don't mind me. I, I <laughs> It's okay. Ian, if you found that photo for me, uh, that would be great. Um, I'm the nurse who rocking my third to sleep watching your chant. Amazing. That's awesome, Derek. Uh, congratulations while you uh, do that. There you go. Right there. That is my uh, my little boy, Griffin. That's my son, my one-year-old. Uh, love of my life. I love that kid more than anything. He has been the best thing to ever happen to me. And I don't know if you guys have kids, but it, <laughs> for a long time, I was a long-lost soul. And, man, finding, finding my wife and finding my son was the best two things ever happened to me. And my son is the best. He is the coolest. But that's my son, Griffin, and our uh, the little um, screenshot of our little baby, Obviously, we're not finding out until the baby's born, but there you are. Those are the two of them, and it's the coolest thing in the entire world. My favorite thing. But, okay, so, yeah, likely Miami's not going to trade with the Bills. So let's go ahead. We'll resume, and maybe we can get to the Vikings because the Vikings did get, let's see, the Vikings did get uh, Jaden Daniels. So they did get their quarterback. So maybe they'd be willing to go ahead and trade 23. Let's take a look and see what that looks like. Oh, and Brian Thomas is gone. <laughs> just just like that. What an offense so that would be, though. Brian Thomas Jr., uh, Devonta Smith, and um, and why am I blanking? Brian Thomas Jr., hold on one second. You ever get to those moments where you just completely forget everything? That's where I'm at all the time right now, now that I have a kid and I'm working full-time. Uh, I literally have no brain cells left. I'm so tired. AJ Brown, dear Lord, don't mind me. I apologize. Sometimes I'm here. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm really good with this stuff and it comes to me. And other times like today, because if you don't know, I am by trade a mailman. That is my primary job besides this. Uh, I was outside in like 28 degree weather today. And I swear to God, I got home. My son was playing in our playroom and I fell asleep on the floor when I got home because I was just so wiped out. So by the time I get to the show at the end of the night, I am so exhausted. So I, I, I love the fact that you guys are here because you 100% keep me going, keep this show rolling, and make this so much fun for me. So I do very much appreciate it. So, okay, we are at 24. Since Brian Thomas is gone, I almost just feel you might as well just wait, right? You might as well just wait and just go all the way there because I don't feel there's no, there's nothing that I am willing to trade up to go ahead and find at this point. So let's go ahead and resume the draft and we'll see it was what ava what is available at 28. Okay. So, wow. We have a couple really nice options here. Liatu Latu. Man. Okay. Folks. <laughs> and if John Hellcamp from uh, Cover One, one of my buddies, another one of our Cover One dudes, the guy, which, by the way, if you haven't checked out the Cover One uh, draft channel, do it. Man, they they have awesome content. Uh, Dan and, and, um, and John do an unbelievable job providing great draft con content coverage. Um, but you got Layatu Latu, and man, if Layatu Latu was available at 28, I think Brandon Bean would sprint, sprint to the podium. I, I'd have a hard time walking away from that. Um, man, that's tough. Ed and I Mitchell obviously went just before the Bills at twenty six. Said so did Jackson Powers Johnson. I, I just feel like if Latu is there, I don't know how you pass up, and I think we do have to take him. So the Bills, you know, later on. Maybe there's an opportunity for the bill. And let's take a look. Let's um let's bring up hold on one sec. Let's see. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at 60, see what's available. Um is a good one. I mean, I I at the moment. It's not a bad thing. 
saying that you like McConkie is not a bad thing. Honestly, I would be if McConk. I mean, unless Latu's there, I'd be very, I'd be very disappointed if Latu was there and they went McConkie as good as McConkie is. Passing up on Mc, I think, I think Latu Latu has the chance of being a generation, like one of those like JJ Watt. Or TJ Watt fell, you know, TJ Watt fell to the end of the first round. That type of talent. That guy is, if you haven't watched him yet, please go take a look. Um, a couple years ago, he was retired because he dealt with an injury. He's been fine. Health wise, he's in the clear. They've done, I, I know for a fact that the Bills have done background checks on his medicals. He is that good. Um, so let's take a look right now, take a look at some wide receivers. And I'll be honest with you, there's, uh, there is a large swath of Bills fans that would be very mad at me if I don't take Xavier Legat here. Um, Xavier Legat would absolutely fit the role of what the Bills need as that X receiver, a guy with great speed, good size, uh, pretty darn good hands. I think that would be uh, an impeccable selection. Tell me what you guys think. Put in the chat right now who you guys think. Do I go Xavier Legat right here? Do I do I go ahead and try to take care of wide receiver or do we maybe take a different position and try to go another round without? I mean, we've got Chris Jenkins, uh, defensive tackle from Michigan, a very, very high-end talent. Um, I think Leggett is a perfect, perfect mix. Um, Tavondre Sweat, we do have him. You could trade back a little bit, see what options here. Uh the Bills could go ahead. They could trade to 77 with the Raiders, pick up 77 and 112. So they'd pick up another fourth rounder. That's a potential right there. Um, I th I don't know. Worthy actually already went, so he is gone. And Troy Franklin is already gone as well. So uh, wide receiver-wise, let me go ahead and actually... I'm going to bring up which wide receivers are available just so you guys can see. Jalen Polk, Xavier Legat, Jalen McMillan. Those were the two that Matt Harmon was mentioning, the two wide receivers outside of Adunze. Uh, Tez Walker, Javon Baker, the guy that uh, Matt and a lot of us, Jamari Thrash, another one right there. A lot of us at Cover One love Javon Baker. So um, currently, I think we have studs all around. I like Cook and Murray, but I'd uh, much rather see a dynamic running back, keep people scribbling. Uh, out in the field, run it right up the gut. Okay, okay. Um, I want a safety to fall to round two. Okay, kitchens. Let's see what safeties are available. That's not a bad bad option. Take a look and see what uh, choices the Bills have at that present moment. Cam Kitchens is available. So we could go ahead or you could wait and maybe see if a, you know, Tyke Smith with our new uh, defensive coordinator was there or defense coordinator, excuse me, our co uh, cornerbacks coach, uh, Jamil Adai, he did coach Tyke Smith. So uh, potential right there, uh, as well as Cameron Kitchens, one of the better, right? Um, that's an option right there. In terms of defensive line, let's take a look at defensive line, what's available. Chris Jenkins, Brandon Dorless, Tavondre Sweat, a guy that everybody's like, Michael Hall, uh, Bruce Nolan's guy, Dwayne Carter. Um we could try to see. Let's see if we can add a third round pick, right? Could we go ahead and trade? And let's take a look at the value. 60 to 64 isn't very much. You're talking eight points. You're not going to get much to trade back that far. And 95 is 40 points. So if you wanted to get that, you're talking probably, let's see, from 60 to 77, you're talking a difference of... um. Let's see, 28 points. So you're talking, it's possible they might give you 95. It's a little bit higher, but they might. We could try that. Let's go ahead and try. Let's try, um, excuse me, what was that? I don't think they're going to give you that. I think that's, yeah, that's not going to happen. So let's go ahead and try the Raiders. Maybe they'll give you 77 and 112. They will. So the Raiders would go ahead and trade you 77 and 112 for 60. You guys tell me, what do you think? Do we go ahead and do that? Do we go ahead and trade from 60 to 77 and add another uh, pick right there? That 112 would be uh, about what, 11 picks into the fourth round. So you would have, the Buffalo Bills would have 112 
um, 128 and 133 of the fourth round. You guys tell me. So there's an option of trading and getting that. Or, like I said, if you guys want to, we can absolutely go ahead. And there's the option of taking uh, Xavier Leggett. I think Xavier Leggett would be a fantastic pick right at that spot. A guy that would absolutely, you know, be that guy. Um, I'm a no. I'm a no about what? Need to get rid of that late round picks to get more earlier picks. Okay. I don't know if I want to keep trading around. I kind of, I, I like the idea of Leggett here. There are some other options. I think Leggett is a really, really nice addition. I don't know if I like trading with the, the Chiefs because the Chiefs, I'm sh- let's see what they did in the first round. The Chiefs took, oh, Chiefs took, Chiefs took Lad, uh, Lad McConkey. So it is possible that they might not take a wide receiver in between them. But you're not going to get anything. You might get, let's see, from them you might get what? Yep, you could get 131 and 64. So 131 would be, um, we would have 131 and 133. So you'd have two picks in the back of the fourth. You might be able to take them and package up and get into the, the top of the fourth or the bottom of the third, potentially. If you do that, you get 35. You could probably get to the bottom of the third. So it's up to you guys. We could do that. But you know, you're trading to trade. You're you're trading back to trade up. Maybe get a little higher into there. Not a bad idea. Let's see. I think that's not a bad option. I think we just go with Xavier Legat. I think that's the move. That's what we're gonna do. Okay, we're gonna move on here and uh, speed this up so we can get to the next pick because we gotta. We got to hurry up, folks. We are already at a minute and five. Which, by the way, I do just want to say, um, make sure you go ahead and hit me with a follow on Twitter right here at the Thomas Delos. I do have a giveaway going on right now on my Twitter channel. All you got to do is um, go ahead. There's a tweet that's out there. Uh, I'll make sure to pin it after the show. But if you go ahead and hit me with a follow and retweet that tweet, uh, if I get to 10,000 followers by September 1st, I will uh, I will give away a pair of tickets to the home opener for the Buffalo Bills. So go ahead, make sure, follow, and retweet that tweet. You'll uh, be in the running for a pair of tickets to the home opener for the Buffalo Bills. So here we are. We are on the clock right here. And there's some good options. Some good options for the Buffalo Bills uh, we could go ahead and let's take a look and see what safety options. Bo Braid, Malik Mustafa. So a couple of the safeties went off the board. That is disappointing. Obviously, we lost some chances there. Defensive interior. Let's take a look. We got McKinley Jackson, a guy that we talked about before. Uh, very, very talented. Uh, Christian Boyd, another one that's very, very talented. Defensive interior. Um, Makai Wingo, another very, very good Interior defensive lineman, Mason Smith, uh, a guy that went through an ACL injury and has struggled to kind of get back to form. But, man, if he could, he's a monster. Um, But, obviously, first round you had uh, the the defensive end. I think that's going to be good. I think maybe you go ahead and you take a McKinley Jackson or do maybe we go ahead and take a – do they get a running back? Do they get a Braylon Allen, a guy with a ton of talent right there? Do they maybe double up on wide receiver, right? Let's see what wide receivers we got. Cornelius Johnson is uh, somebody that a lot of people have loved. That's definitely a very, very valuable option. Interior offensive line, you got Cooper Beebe, Zach, Winter, uh, Zach Zinter, Drake Nugent, one of the better centers in the draft a little bit later in there. In terms of offensive tackles, got some interesting ones. Uh, Lomea, Isaiah Adams, a guy that we've talked about before. Uh, definitely a couple options there. So there's definitely uh, some interesting prospects for sure. I think McKinley Jackson is a guy that the Bills would definitely like. Um, Corner is possible. There is some interesting corner options right here. Let's take a look. Yeah, Kalen Carson, Josh Newton from TCU is a really, really nice one. Um, I don't know if they'd go corner this early, though, to be honest with you. 
unless the tail was just sticking out like a sore thumb, right? If, if like, you know, like a Cooper DeGene, right? If he had fallen to 28, I think that's the type of guy that would stick out to them. So uh, let's go ahead. Let's take McKinley Jackson. I love Braylon Allen, but I don't think they're going to go running back again early in the draft. I think that's just asking for trouble. So let's go ahead, McKinley Jackson. We got a couple more right here. And Braylon Allen's still available. Do we just bite the bullet? Braylon Allen with our fourth pick at pick 130 or 129. Let's do it. Let's get a stud running back right there. A guy that's an absolute monster of a back. Then we can go ahead and start filling out some soft. Makai Wingo, I think, is a great option here. Nelson Caesar, a very, very good defensive end out of Houston. Uh, you know, bringing another Houston guy. Maybe. Isaiah Adams, shore up that that tackle position. I think that'd be uh, interesting right there. Let's take a look at the safety position. Let's see what uh, what options they have still out there for us. We do have Malik Mustafa. Bo Braid is another one that's still there. I think we wait a little bit. I like Malik Mustafa from uh, Wake Forest. We could try to snag him in a couple picks. Let's see what wide receivers we've got. We've got Marcus, Rosemi, Jack Saint, and Taj Washington are some interesting ones. Okay. Uh, definitely of potential for the Buffalo Bills there. But I think at this moment, I think Makai Wingo sticks out like a sore thumb, a guy that I think uh, shows a lot of promise for them. So let's go ahead and shore up another big position of need. Once, to, once we get to 160, let's take a look. Oh, we got Zach Zinter sitting there. I, I think Malik Mustafa is a good one, and then maybe we go ahead and finalize it at the end with Drake Nugent, the center out of Michigan. Really filling out all the needs. And there he is. I think that is a stunner of a draft. Let's take a look right there, guys. I like it. I like it a lot. I'm going to go ahead and what I'll do is I'm going to download this and I'll tweet this out so you guys can take a look at this after. But rounding out, Layatu Latu, number 28 uh, out of UCLA. At the 60th pick, we got Xavier Leggett out of uh, South Carolina. McKinley Jackson, defensive uh, defensive tackle out of Texas A&M. Braylon Allen, running back out of Wisconsin. Makai Wingo, uh, another defensive tackle out of LSU. Malik Mustafa, safety out of Wake. And Drake Nugent, center out of Michigan. So there we are, guys. There is the mock draft for this week. And obviously, we're going to keep doing these week over week. Uh, definitely something. And if you guys like this, if you like these mock drafts, make sure to hit the thumbs up on this video. Make sure you share this and tell people about Buffalo Late Night every Thursday night here on the Cover One Sports Network, 7 p.m. Uh, like I said, we do have another show following up at 9 p.m. It is Greg Thompson, Aaron Quinn. They are going to be uh, continuing on talking about uh, some more wide receiver stuff, some more interesting stuff. And I believe what they're covering, they're coming up, they're uh, covering a free agency wrap up. So they're going to talk about everything and anything in between. But guys, I do, uh, I do appreciate you guys tonight. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, make sure again, like I said, give Matt uh, Harmon a follow. Go check out Re Reception Perception. Uh, and if you missed that part of the segment, once the show's over, go take a look. It was fantastic. Really, really good stuff there. Uh, as always, my name is Thomas DeLoss. You can find me at or on Twitter at the Thomas Delage. Thomas Delos, I'm losing it. I appreciate you. I love you. It has been a lot of fun tonight, and I am excited. We are about four weeks out from the NFL draft. We'll keep going, ladies and gentlemen. Until then, let's keep our eyes open, see what talent is going to come into Buffalo. Maybe we bring in Julian Blackman. Maybe we bring in somebody else. But until next week, this has been Buffalo Late Night. Let's go, Bills. <laughs>